Tonight I will be reading from Good Enough About Me by by Daniel Mendelssohn, originally published by The New Yorker on January 17, 2010. In August of 1929, Sigmund Freud scoffed at the notion that he would do anything as crass as write an autobiography. That is of course quite an impossible suggestion, he wrote to his nephew, who had conveyed an American publisher's suggestion that the great man write his life story. Outwardly, Freud went on, perhaps a try disingenuously, my life has passed calmly and uneventfully and can be covered by a few dates. Inwardly, and who knew better question mark things were a bit more complicated. A psychologically complete and honest confession of life, on the other hand, would require so much indiscretion, on my part as well as on that of others, about family, friends, and enemies, most of them still alive, that it is simply out of the question. What makes all autobiographies worth this is, after all, their mendacity. Freud ended by suggesting that the $5,000 advance that had been offered was a hundredth of the sum necessary to tempt him into such a full hard venture. Unseemly self-exposures, unpalatable betrayals, unavoidable mendacity, a subson of meretriciousness, memoir, for much of its modern history, has been the black sheep of the literary family. Like a drunken guest at a wedding, it is constantly mortifying its soberer relatives, philosophy, history, literary fiction spilling family secrets, embarrassing old friends, motivated, it would seem, by an overpowering need to be the center of attention. Even when the most distinguished writers and thinkers have turned to autobiography, they have found themselves accused of literary exhibitionism, when they can bring themselves to put on a show at all. When Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Confessions appeared, shocking the salons of 18th century Paris with matter-of-fact descriptions of the author's masturbation and masochism, Edmund Burke lamented the new sort of glory the eminent philosoph was getting from bringing heartily to light the obscure and vulgar vices, which we know may sometimes be blended with eminent talents. The complaint sounds eerily familiar today, when, at the suggestion of her sister, Virginia Woolf started, somewhat reluctantly, to compose an autobiographical sketch, she found herself, inexplicably at first, thinking of a certain hallway mirror, the scene, as further probing of her memory revealed, of an incestuous assault by her half-brother Gerald, an event that her memory had repressed, and about which, in the end, she was unable to write for publication. As it happens, Wolf, the tentative memoirist, met Freud, who wouldn't dream of writing a memoir. When both were nearing the end of their lives, Wolf's nephew Quentin Bell reported that the psychoanalyst presented the novelist with a narcissus. Whatever Freud may have meant by the gesture, it nicely symbolizes the troubling association between creativity and narcissism, an association that is nowhere as intense as when the creation in question is memoir, a literary form that exposes the author's life without the protective masks afforded by fiction. Such self-involvement, as Ben Yagoda's fact-packed if not terribly searching book memoir, A History, Riverhead, $25.95, reminds you, is just one of the charges that have been leveled against memoirs and their authors over the centuries, the others being the ones that Freud was so leery of, indiscretion, betrayal, and outright fraud. But it's the ostensible narcissism that has irritated critics the most. A decade and a half ago, the distinguished critic William Gass fulminated against the whole genre in a scathing Harper's essay, in which he asked, rhetorically, whether there were any motives for the enterprise that aren't tainted with conceit or a desire for revenge or a wish for justification? To hail the sinner's head? To put an ego already inflated past safety? The outburst came at a moment when a swelling stream of autobiographical writing that had begun in the late 80s was becoming what Agoda calls a flood. By the end of the 90s, a New York Observer review of one writer's R.S.T. book, a memoir, could open with an uncontroversial reference to this confessional age, in which memoirs and personal revelations tumble out in unprecedented abundance. The memoirist in question was me, more on that later. By now, the flood feels like a tsunami. Things have got to the point where the best a reviewer can say about a personal narrative is, well, that it's not like a memoir, 
This is not a woe is me memoir of the sort so much in fashion these days, the book critic of the Washington Post wrote recently in an admiring review of Katie Martin's Enemies of the People, an account of how the journalist's family suffered under communist rule in Hungary. But, as Yagoda makes clear, confessional memoirs have been irresistible to both writers and readers for a very long time, and, pretty much from the beginning, people have been complaining about the shallowness, the opportunism, the lying, the betrayals, the narcissism. This raises the question of just why the current state of autobiography feels somehow different, somehow worse than never before, more narcissistic and more disturbing in its implications. And it may well be that the answer lies not with the genre, which has, in fact, remained fairly consistent in its aims and its structure for the past millennium and a half or so, but with something that has shifted, profoundly, in the way we think about ourselves and our relation to the world around us. It all started late one night in 371 AD, in a dusty North African town miles from anywhere worth going, when a rowdy 16-year-old, the offspring of an interfaith marriage, with a history of bad behavior, stole some hairs off a neighbor's tree. To all appearances, it was a pointless misdemeanor. The thief, as he ruefully recalled some 30 years later, was neither poor nor hungry, and the pairs weren't all of it appealing, anyway. He stole them, he realized, simply to be bad. It was foul, and I loved it, he wrote. I loved my own undoing. However trivial the crime and perverse its motivations, this bit of petty larceny had enormous consequences, for the teenager's future, for the history of Christianity and Western philosophy, and for the layout of your local Barnes and Noble superstar. For although the boy eventually straightened himself out, converted to Christianity, and even became a bishop, the man he became was tortured by the thought of this youthful peccadillo. His desire to seek a larger meaning in his troubled past ultimately moved him to write a star on his account of his dissolute early years, he is disarmingly frank about his prolific sex life, and his stumbling progress towards spiritual transcendence, to the climactic moment when, by looking inward with what he calls his soul's eye, he saw above that same eye of my soul the immutable light higher than my mind. The man's name was Aurelius Augustinus, we know him as Saint Augustine. His book was called Confessions. As Augustine, a teacher of rhetoric, well knew, there had long been a tradition of biographies of accomplished men, who talks lives, say, written at the end of the RSD century A.D. and of autobiographical accounts of daring military escapades and the like. Xenophon's Anabasis, for instance, written in the 4th century BC, recounts how he and his troops managed to make their way back to safety after getting trapped behind enemy lines deep in what is now Iraq, but Augustine was the R.S.D. Western author to make the accomplishment an invisible, internal one, and the journey to salvation a spiritual one. The arc from utter abjection to a probable redemption, at once deeply personal and appealingly universal, is one that writers have returned to, and readers have been insatiable for, ever since. Augustine of Hippo bequeathed to Augustine Burroughs more than just a name. To be sure, the autobiography as an entertaining record of hair-raising or merely risque scrapes has also proved resilient, from Benvenuto Cellini's riddled autobiography to Errol Flynn's outrageous My Wicked, Wicked Ways. I played regularly, or irregularly, with a little girl next door named Narita. The actor reminisced about his childhood in Australia, but the memoir's essentially religious DNA, the Augustinian preoccupation with bearing written witness to remarkable inner transformations, remained dominant during the 16th century from the confessions to Burroughs's running with scissors. Among the earliest vernacular memoirs in the post-classical tradition were so-called spiritual law autobiographies. Saint Teresa of the Villa composed one in Spanish, as did Saint Ignatius Loyola, a 15th century woman named Marjorie Cam, whose autobiographical journey included some rather less exalted matter, not least, how she negotiated a sexless marriage with her avid husband, gave us what is considered to be the RST memoir in English. After the Reformation, the Protestants took up the form, partly in response to the Puritan call for a narrow examination of thyself and the course of thy life. As the 16th century divine William Perkins put it, 
The memoir is a negative examination of the self, a form in which to showcase our reasons to be, in John Calvine's words, displeased with ourselves, indelibly mark the Anglophone autobiographical tradition thereafter, as did a resultant vaingloriousness about the extent of one's waywardness. The title of John Bunyan's Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, 1666, a masterpiece of the conversion narrative, is an allusion to an epistle of Paul, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Bunyan's book spawned a line of unholier-than-thou first-person narratives that has culminated in the memoirs of abjection with which we are surrounded today. James frays a million little pieces, with its day glow depictions of addiction and recovery. Catherine Harrison's The Kiss, a reminiscence of father-daughter incest. Tony Bentley's Surrender, about the author's penchant for anal sex. The list, as we know, goes on. The crucial moment in the evolution of a suffering and redemption memoir from its religious origin to its profane zany, or nadir, today occurred as the age of faith yielded to the age of reason. Yagoda rightly emphasizes the importance of Rousseau's Confessions published in 1782, four years after the philosopher's death, for the secular transformation of the genre. The Confessions came at the beginning of a boom and memoir writing that some found deplorable. By 1827, John Lockhart, the biographer of Sir Walter Scott, could rail against the mania for this garbage of confessions, and recollections, and reminiscences. Rousseau's work is striking now less for its frankness, which left little of the memoirist's life to the imagination, than for the way it anticipates the present in its representation of memoir writing as a kind of therapeutic purge. One of the most interesting passages in the Confessions mirrors Augustine's Confessions in recounting an ostensibly minor youthful infraction. In Rousseau's case, it was the theft of a bit of ribbon in the house of the family he worked for. Rousseau's crime had more serious immediate repercussions than Augustine's. When the theft was discovered, he blamed a young woman who worked as a cook in the same household. Forty years later, the only way he could ease his guilt was to write about it. This burden, then, has lain unalleviated on my conscience until this very day, and I can safely say that the desire to be in some measure relieved of it has greatly contributed to the decision I have taken to write my confessions. For better or worse, Rousseau gave the impetus to the transformation of confession into a secular, public, and purely literary gesture. He understood that this secularization was a step without precedent, as he writes at the beginning of the confessions. In the hands of a great thinker the form could yield great insights, but few of us are Rousseau. Once the memoir stopped being about God and started being about man, once confession came to mean nothing more than getting a shameful secret off your chest and, maybe worse, once redemption came to mean nothing more than the cozy acceptance offered by other people, many of whom might well share the same secret, it was but a short step to what the Times book critic Michiko Kakutini recently characterized as the motivating force behind certain other products of the recent memoir craze, the belief that confession is therapeutic and therapy is redemptive and redemption somehow equals art. Virtually at the time that Rousseau was writing, redemption was being reddened on this side of the Atlantic, too. From the start, there had been a strong taste in the colonies for tales of rescues and escapes, local incarnations of those old adventure memoirs. The 17th century saw a number of best-selling accounts by settlers who had been captured by savages and later escaped. These, the go to suggests provided the blueprint for the subcategory of contemporary American memoir that includes Patty Hearst's 1982 account of her kidnapping by the Symbionese Liberation Army, but a hundred years later another, new kind of escape memoir began to emerge, one that combined previous strains, the memoir as a record of dangers overcome and as a road map of spiritual renewal, while giving them a powerful new political resonance, the slave narrative. Running the gamut from the several reminiscences of Frederick Douglass, which the author revised and republished a number of times between 1845 and 1892, to the 1849 life story of one Henry, Boss, Brown, who escapes to freedom by mailing himself by parcel post from Virginia to Philadelphia. These autobiographies by slaves and former slaves are remarkable for being among the rest memoirs that were meant to serve as politically meaningful testimony to systemic crimes against an entire people. As such, 
They anticipate both in form and in function the numerous memoirs written by survivors of the Holocaust and other government-sponsored genocides of the 20th century. The earliest of the slave narratives were, in fact, contemporaneous with a vast body of political escape narratives that Jagoda, with his nearly exclusive focus on the Anglophone tradition, nowhere mentions the memoirs written by those who had the French Revolution and often landed on distant and improbable shores, one acquaintance of Marie Antoinette's milked cows near Albany, before returning, eventually, to France. In these autobiographies, elements of both witness literature and survival epic are combined. What the slave narratives, the émigré accounts, and the Holocaust and genocide memoirs have in common is that, in them, the stakes of redemption are much higher than ever before. Now the soul's eye that Augustine spoke of was turned outward as well as inward, documenting the suffering self but also, necessarily, recording the tormenting other. The implicit and conditional universality in Augustine's suffering and redemption narrative, this happened to me, and could happen to you, if you did what I did became indicative and explicit in the memoir of political suffering, what happened to me happened to many others. Each of these witness memoirs had to bear an awful burden, standing in for the thousands of memoirs that would never be written. As the I became we, the personal journey that had begun in the 4th century was transformed by the end of the 18th, into a highly political one. The conversation between oneself and God had become a conversation with, and about, the whole world. As the implications of the memoir have grown in importance, so has the seriousness, and the consequences, of another complaint made about it, what Freud called mendacity. The need for certain kinds of memoir to be true goes back to Augustine's confessions, if the anguish and the suffering aren't real, there's nothing to redeem, and the whole exercise becomes pointless. It is precisely the redemption memoir status as a witness to real life that makes the outrage so loud when the memoir is falsified. By contrast, if Errol Flynn vetted 10 more or 10 fewer starlets than he claims, you don't feel cheated, this outrage tends to be exacerbated when the book in question claims to bear witness to social and political injustice. Goda, who is at his energetic best when indicting phony memoirs, gleefully recounts how a book called The Blood Runs Like a River Through My Dreams one of three memoirs by a Native American writer called Nazdij, in which the author rehearses the catalogue of sufferings, fetal alcohol syndrome, migrant life, homelessness, HIV infection, that fueled his resentful rejection of Western ways, turned out to have been written by a twice-married white Midwesterner whose other literary output includes gay s and erotica.